My name is uh, Kevin Sorkin. I'm founder and chief executive of Global Government Forum and your moderator for today. Thank you all for joining us. This webinar will focus on supporting civil service decision making, the role of finance. I would also like to thank our knowledge partner Workday for their support and valuable insight today. You can send us questions uh, throughout the presentation by typing them in the facility provided on your webinar screen and we will address uh, any questions in the Q&A at the end after the presentation. Our expert presenters uh, from Workday are Stephen Creech, St Senior Product Marketing Manager, EMEA Workday, uh, Edward Bass, Account Executive Public Sector from Workday, and Andy Goff, Senior Solutions Consultant from Workday. Now to start us off, please can I welcome Stephen. Thanks, Kevin, and hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar today. So in this webinar today, we plan to discuss the changing mandate of the finance function, reflect on the challenges this sector faces, understand how you can leverage technologies to build out analytical capabilities and deliver insights, and to view some of the benefits of a modern platform for finance and HR. My name is Stephen Creech and I'm part of the product team here at Workday and I'll be leading today's presentation. As Kevin said, I'm joined by Ed Bass, an account executive at Workday who's previously worked in the government and has spoken with a number of individuals at all different levels uh, of government about the challenges within the finance function. We're also going to be, or we are joined by Andy Goff, our uh, senior solution consultant at Workday, who's going to take us through a couple of short demonstrations. I have to make you aware of, our, of the Safe Harbour Statement. Uh, this presentation will contain some current and forward-looking statements and product releases. Should you go on to consider Workday, we ask that you base any decisions upon services, features and functions that are currently available. So we know the role of finance is to be the stewards of the physical and financial resources within a given organisation. However, at Workday, we started by trying to understand what the purpose of the function is. We believe that the purpose for any support function, including finance, is to add value. And in finance, this can be achieved by being efficient, reducing the cost of operations, focusing on strategic activities, and minimizing the time spent on non-value add activities. Secondly, it's about delivering effective services through the production of timely reports and analysis, delivering effective support and being seen as a strategic partner. And thirdly, it's about promoting a culture of control where governance and regulatory compliance and reporting requirements are met. You only have to search transformation or look at the websites of consultancies or research businesses to see that there's an array of surveys and studies, all which point to finance not achieving the grander strategic objectives. Indeed, our own research carried out last year of over 670 finance leaders across industries and geographies identified four key themes to redefining the finance function of the future to ensure that it could meet the demands placed upon it. The overarching result was that we found finance to be the center of the strategic planning and decision-making processes within an organization. However, today they are being overwhelmed by the demands that are being placed on them. In the future, finance leaders will need to be confident to talk people issues such as talent and leadership as they are talking about analytics and change. And in order to be that strategic partner to the business, leaders will need to be able to combine the best finance talent with the best technology to create an augmented finance function. So I'd just like to take a minute to explore some of these research findings in a little bit more detail. The first theme is around resilience, resilience to internal and external threats. Less than 40% of finance leaders said they were highly confident about managing their top risks. This results in extra effort being spent to ensure accurate data and reliable data and thus potentially delaying decision making. The second theme is to become smarter and make more use of the data to drive business intelligence. Integrating finance and non-finance data is currently the number one block to achieving this ambition. Data is at the heart of organizations 
and it's getting the data right that is critical to making and enabling the right decisions. The third theme identified that there needs to be greater collaboration across the C-suite to deliver more effective outcomes. This is currently happening, oops, this is currently happening in less than 40% of the organization surveyed, resulting in decision-making that potentially hasn't considered all of the relevant parties. And the final priority was for the finance function to address the talent mix. The survey showed the number one barrier to finance function innovation is the lack of relevant and available skills within the finance team, with the task to fill these gaps a significant challenge. So finance needs to address these four areas in order to become more strategic business partners and play a critical role in the success of, of a government department or, or organisation. So I'm now going to hand over to Ed, who's going to talk around some of the challenges he's encountered in the civil service, which have impacted finance and its ability to provide rapid and reliable decision making. Ed, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, and thank you, Kevin, as well. So back in the um, you know back in the 90s, when I was in the Home Office in finance, um, I think it is fair to say that we used to keep score, and and finance did a great job, I think, back then of of helping guide the, uh, uh, the, you know, the departments, helping guide the cost center managers in terms of uh, what they had spent and, and helping them, if you like, forecast to the end of the year. But it was fairly rudimentary, as you can imagine back then. And some of the reasons for that, I'm just gonna explore with you, uh, with you now. Because at the end of the day, I think it is fair to say that what we are trying to achieve here is to very much fall in line with, I think, what Mike Driver is, uh, is looking for in terms of that transformation of finance, which is really to put finance at the heart of decision making and, and getting behind driving the agenda, as I said, and not just keeping score. Keeping score is something that really should be a, uh, a simple self-service activity these days. So finance, of course, we all know is critical to the success of the government. And, and this recent quote by Mike Driver, of course, states that. But I mean, of course, at the end of the day, um, you know, finance is a much, much more broader uh, you know, division in terms of the role that they're delivering to the partners, because it's much more of an enabling function. And I think we have to always remember that um, it is the delivery based on the fiscal plan that is so important here and that finance need to support that as best as they can. So when we look back in the sort of the early days of the evolving technologies, you know, first when mainframes were installed back in the 80s and that shift was very much to sort of um, ERP happening towards the end of the millennium, where, you know, if you like, government technology has been evolving and data and data sets within departments have also been evolving. But I think it is fair to say that what we have found is that the, if you like, the style of, of the data in terms of where it is kept, in terms of the different divisions within a single department that may have a role to play over data. It could be, uh, it could be maybe the financial planning, it could be the stats guys, it could be finance, it could be HR, it could be within the operational teams. There's lots of different fiscal and, and if you like operational data sets that are sitting out there. And because of that fragmentation, it is making difficult the ability of finance, if you like, to take control of all of that and to if you like, reduce risk and increase the, the value of that data overall. So we've seen that evolving technologies moving towards, you know, from the 90s into sort of the 10, uh, you know, sort of 2010, in terms of how finance is very much changing. So still fundamental is controlling the, if you like, physical and financial assets, but finances are much more strategic um, provider of, of guidance, if you like, to the departments. And of course, as, as you know, many of the, the key um, jobs, the, the, the top jobs, board level jobs, of course, now, um, now they have incumbent uh, finance professionals as well. So it's a great uh, scene that we have here today, I think, where finance is very much evolving and taking control, if you like, of very much the, if you like, the delivery of the fiscal plan and supporting that uh, decision making. But um, when we look at it, um, there still is that challenge based on those agile and uh, so those aging legislative systems which are which are if you like I feel holding back the public sector very much in in the day-to-day -day, um, pressure on the finance team 
so when we put all of that together and we consider you know sort of what are the external factors impacting uh impacting the finance so first of all if you like we're operating with reduced funding so austerity is taking uh, a, a key role here um there's increased public expectations that we're driving if you like great engagement from if you like both inside and outside in terms of confidence and ability to deliver and to deliver efficiency so there's that that need to drive greater information out to the public and of course there's that need to meet regulatory changes uh, and scenario planning as well as that vital uh, if you like forecasting and ever need to continue to change we all know the challenges that brexit if you like brought upon us in terms of being able to uh, if you like take key staff from key operational areas uh, put them into if you like brexit no deal plan teams and still deliver uh, from within the teams and that was only possible obviously uh, in that the, this was a very well managed exercise within the departments and the information that finance gave was absolutely vital to that so I think we have to really consider that what finance needs to be delivering today is, is if you like, a much broader function where there is that sort of significant expectation placed on um, the function to be able to support that decision making, but to do it with much more data than just the fiscal data itself as well. So where costs are spiraling, days dominated by manual processing controls, we need to make sure that the assembly and the construction of data of both if you like that fiscal data, but that uh, operational data that is blended into that can help provide rapid decision uh, support back to uh, back to the departments to ensure that they're functioning opera they're functioning uh, optimally. So, what does good decision making look like? It's definitely about getting the fundamentals right. It's having timely information. But more importantly, it's also supplying timely information and relevant information in a self-service manner so that individuals that are delivering functions can manage their data and make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And that finance and the business partners, particularly within finance, can support that day-to-day -day information with the strategic information help to drive the departments going forward. So let's have a look at how finance systems can enable decision making in organisations and government departments today. So I'm going to hand over to Andy now, and he's going to take you through a, an example of how Workday, for example, would take you through uh, a, short, um, a short demonstration on, on delivery of information. Thanks, Ed. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to... Um regain control of my mouse and I'm going to switch across to my workday system. So later on in this session we're, we're going to talk about the future of technology and finance and how emerging technologies can be applied to deliver incremental benefits to finance but before we do that I think it's important to concentrate on this idea of getting the basics right and look at how modern IT systems today before we apply machine learning and augmenting analytics and so on can help everybody in the organization make better decisions and have access to relevant information to support those decisions, be they operational people with a job to do that doesn't involve finance much, or whether they're managers managing budgets or targets, or whether they're executives and senior finance people who need to keep an eye on the overall performance of the organization. So I'm gonna take a few roles in the next five minutes or so. I'm gonna start as this person, Emma Hobson. So this is Workday, I'm just accessing this through my browser here, and I'm gonna sign in as Emma. And when I do sign in, Emma's pre presented here with a, a tailored homepage with ready access to the things she needs to access frequently. So Emma doesn't come into a finance system or an ERP system very often. So when she does, she just needs to get in, do what she needs to do and get out again. Um, and today, all I really want to do is I want to check some basic information. So once I've logged in here as Emma, I can see all of my finance and HR and other information and I can quickly check on stuff. So if I want to check whether I've been paid as I expect it to be, I can very quickly go and look at my payslip, see the details. If I want to generate a printed version, I can do that. But often these days I don't need to because it's available to me on my browser or on my phone at any point. Equally, if I need to do stuff, I can, I can click on the buttons here to uh, carry out basic transactions. Or increasingly in modern systems, I might want to do that in a more conversational way. So this icon down the bottom here is the Workday Assistant, which is the evolution of conversational technologies into Workday. So if Emma wants to spend some of her pay that she's just seen she, she's received on 
a holiday, she might want to ask, how much holiday do I have? And she can type things in or speak things in, in, in natural language. And the system understands and can present relevant information back to her. So it's checking, she wants to check her accrued leave balance. That is what she wanted to do. So now without having to click through screens and, and enter transactions or inquiries or run reports, Emma's now got visibility that she's got 28 days of holiday left. And she can now make a decision as to whether she wants to book that off. So I want to take next Friday off. And the system again has interpreted the language, take next Friday off or take holiday or book leave or whatever terminology she may use. And it's correctly identified that she's looking to book a, a leave request here. And it's now asking what type of leave is it? Is it sickness or is it holiday or what is it? So I'm gonna say it's holiday. And it's now said, yep, do you confirm you want to book the 19th of July, which is next Friday? And I say yes. And that's done. That's done a transaction within the system. So in a few quick questions and answers there, Emma's been able to check how much leave she's got accrued and she's been able to submit a leave request. And if I go and look at Emma's audit history here, which shows me everything Emma's ever done, you see here Emma's created a leave request for that day and that's gone off. If we look in here, we can see that's gone off to Edward, who's her manager, to approve it. So automatically the system's working out just as a result of that conversation Emma had with Workday. She wanted to raise a relief request and that needs to be approved by Edward. And that, that's happened. That's now waiting for Edward to approve. And when he does approve it, Emma will get told. While we're in here, talking about ready access to my information, if, if Emma clicks on her profile at the top here, this is where all the information that we hold about Emma is held. So she can check that, for example, her contact information is correct. We can see here that Emma is a customer service rep working for Edward. She's been here quite a long time. So it may be that Emma's starting to get itchy and wants to move to another job. She may be thinking of leaving the organization. We don't want that to happen. So what we've got down here is a nice, easy way for Emma to look at what else could I do within the department to progress my career without having to actually leave and go and work somewhere else. So when I click into this opportunity graph here as Emma, it's saying, well, you're, she's a customer service rep. Based on machine learning around what other customer service reps in the past like Emma went on to do next, it's saying the obvious move for you is to become a senior customer service rep, and that's what 39% of your peers did. But if Emma doesn't fancy that and wants to take a change, she can look at other roles that might be appropriate to her by clicking on these different suggestions here. So 17% of people like Emma went on to become a manager. That might be something that appeals to me. So I can click on that tile, and now I can see everything I need to know about being a manager in the organization. So what skills and qualifications do I need? What training might I need to undertake to get myself ready for for that role and even who else is already in that role so I can see down here that Alan is already a manager I might want to network and connect to Alan and have a conversation with him about what, how he found the transition from customer service to management so again very quick easy access to information and then if I want to express interest in being a manager in future I can click the button here and I'll be included in any future internal vacancies so it's very much about providing easy information to Emma to do the things she needs to be able to do and do them in an informed way. The last thing I want to do here is Emma's been on a training trip. So if we look here in her expenses area, she started compiling an expense report. And if we open that up, it's a draft expense report at the moment. But we can immediately see what she's been claiming for. So some trains, some parking, some mileage and so on. And there's a warning at the top here. So again, warnings is a good way of providing information in this case about policy compliance. So if I click on that, it's telling me you need to attach a receipt. The policy says everything over 25 pounds in this case needs a receipt. And my taxi fare here doesn't have one. So again, it's, it's informing me of, of potential um, policy violations or bad decisions I'm about to make. It's an or orange warning, so I don't have, I can carry on past it. If that were red, then obviously I'd have to provide my receipt before I could proceed. But for, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead as Emma and I'm going to submit that anyway without the receipt. And it tells me that's now gone off to Katerina. So Katerina is the cost centre manager. The policy says that Katerina needs to approve my expense report and it's now sitting there with Katerina. If I don't know who Katerina is, then I can quickly again access Katerina's record from here and say, all oh, right, that's who she is. I remember her, seen her about the place or if I need to get in touch with her, all of her contact details are there. So everything Emma's doing here, she's doing it in an informed way and knowing what's going on, whether she's in line with the policy, 
whether she's got the holiday and so on. So I'm not going to switch roles and I'm going to become Katerina. So Katerina is a cost centre manager, maybe a budget manager or a departmental manager. And we'll look at how people like Katerina can be provided with better information as well. So again, when I log in, I get very much the same homepage with maybe different icons based on my uh, additional privileges as a manager. But where we're going to focus down here is this inbox. So this is all the things that Katerina needs to do to before she starts her day. So the first thing we can see here is Emma's expense report that we just submitted 53 seconds ago. And I need to go through as Katerina and decide whether to approve that expense report. And before I even get to the expense report, I've got relevant information here about Emma and her previous expense history. So whenever there's a decision that Katerina has to make, we can provide her with relevant reports and analytics to help her make the right decision. So I can see here what, how much Emma's spent in recent months. I can see what expense reports are currently in the pipe or what she submitted recently. But the key one I want to look at here is a policy violation report. So this is telling me how often are Emma's expense reports out of policy? Because we know this one was, because we, we can see the warning at the top, she missed the receipt off. I can see that there's only 14% of her previous expense reports have broken the rules. So she's quite a well-behaved individual and that might constitute a low risk and I don't need to, in this case, challenge her. I can accept this expense report. If that said 75%, I might send it back and reject that one. So here I'm going to improve that. And that gives me the green tick, which basically means that process is completed. So Emma's expense report is now ready for payment, assuming there's nothing else needs to happen there. While we're in here, I wanted to just quickly look at some of these other items in the inbox here. So here's a requisition from this guy, Edward, we saw earlier that Katrina has been asked to approve. He's trying to buy a laptop, as we can see down the bottom here. And again, we can see relevant information to help uh, Katerina make the right decision. So we can see, for example, from the asset register, Edward's already got a laptop and he's only had it for a couple of years. So the policy may well be that he, he can't have a new laptop yet because he's still got one, unless he can provide me with information as to what's wrong with that one. So I might send him that one back and say, what happened to the other one? So again, I'm making an informed decision based on the reports and analytics that have been provided to me in context of those decisions in the business process. And that's gone back to Edward. Here we've got a supplier invoice that I've been asked to approve as a cost center manager. And again, I can see all of the information around that invoice, including who the supplier was. Um, so it was for Dell in this case. I can see that that invoice has actually been matched already. So it's been matched to a purchase order and a receipt and everything appears to be in line, which looks good. And I can also see down here, for example, any attachments. So if there's a scanned image of that invoice, I can check that. And I can see where it's been before it came to me. So it's come from Gwen, if maybe it's an AP, and it's sitting with me as Katerina. So again, I'm happy to approve that. So I'm not making blind decisions. I'm making decisions with contextual information and history to help me make the right choice. And finally, we've got a journal. Everybody likes to see a journal. So I've got an in process, it's an accrual journal that's been entered for legal costs against my cost center. And again, I can see down here, there's a spreadsheet attached, which has got some backing detail. And I can see there's a cost center and there's a ledger account code, all the stuff you'd expect on a journal. What I can also see here though, is a whole set of tags. So these extra, what we call work tags, are extra dimensional information that help um, set the context for that transaction. So it's not just an accrual against my cost centers for legal fees, it's related to a public campaign that I'm running for a particular web channel in a particular area focusing on line of business and, and for a supplier, Grant Thornton. So although this is a journal, I'm tagging the spend category in the supplier here. So later on, I can report on my costs by supplier. So again, contextual information to help you make the right decisions. And we'll approve that one. So that'll do for the inbox. While I'm here, I also wanted to very look, quickly look at how managers like Katerina can be given very easy access to their financial and other information. So I'm going to look at this cost center manager dashboard here as Katerina for my cost center. So I can see I've got a financial report here. I've also got information on my headcount down the bottom here. For some reason my charts are not showing today, which is a bit weird. There should be a pie chart there. there we go. Anyway, so I can see headcount information and I can drill into that, see who they are. I can see a spend trend, any information that's relevant to me. But we're going to focus on this report over here, this budget versus actuals report. And again, if, if I drill into this, what I expect to see is real time information. So if I drill into my travel and expense costs here, I can choose as, as Katerina how I want to see that figure broken down. So I do want to want to see it by project or do I want to see it by supplier or by how do I want to see it? So if I might want to see it by worker since it's cost expense costs. Who in my cost center has been incurring the costs? 
And then I might add in a second dimension, it says what type of costs were they? So we're looking at travel costs here and I can immediately see there's Emma and we can see 30 pounds for meals, 12 pounds for parking, 300 pounds for trains and taxis and so on. And whenever I need to, I can always drill down to the underlying business document here to see the expense reports themselves. And there's the one we just saw being entered a few moments ago. So I've got real time access to the backing detail behind these transactions rather than just a static report that shows me what the budget versus actual information is. And the same applies with my journal. So if I drill into my general and administrative costs here, let's look at that one by a different dimension. We'll look at that one by journal source initially. So I can see I've got some accruals and I've got some supplier invoices. And then if we look at that by supplier, I can see in the column now, I can see that my accrual was for Grant Thornton. So again, because we tagged that transaction with the supplier, even though that's a journal, I can see my total cost by supplier here, as well as my purchasing costs. And again, I can drill into this if I want to and see the underpinning journal with all the details on it. So whatever type of data it is, I can, I can drill into relevant information. So here, as a final example, I can see that my contingent labor costs are higher than expected. So I've got 48,000 pounds worth of temps and contractors in my cost center, which is quite considerable. So again, how would I like to drill on this? Well, since they're people costs, I might want to look at that by people. So who are those contractors? So the C here is telling me these people are contractors. Anton seems to be earning quite a lot of uh, con contractor rates and he's been here for a long time. So I know who Anton is, I recognize his photograph. I can see he's been a contractor in the department under Edward for nearly two years. If I look at that in a different way, now I'm looking at Edward's organization chart. And here I can see Anton working as a contractor in Edward's team in customer service alongside Emma. What I can also see down the bottom here is other information that might explain why there's a long-term contractor in that team. I can see there are five empty vacancies in Edward's team. So he's either lost a lot of people recently and hasn't been able to replace them, or he's expanded his team and hasn't been able to fill the vacancies. But it's probably these, these five vacancies down here, which are resulting in him having to pay contractors to fill the gaps uh, and therefore resulting in those excessive costs. So what I thought was a, a, a financial issue here actually turns out to be a recruitment issue. And if I could maybe fill some of these open posts, then I wouldn't have to apply, uh, employ as many contractors and therefore I could reduce the overall cost. So maybe I would want to look at how are we doing in terms of hiring those to replace those empty vacancies. And I've got a job requisition here. So very quickly, just by a couple of clicks, I can now get across from what started off as a cost center finance report. I'm now looking at the recruitment funnel for that vacancy. And I can see that there are several, lots of people in the process. There are two people at the offer stage. So there are two people who we've interviewed and we've made offers to, to hire them into Edward's team. If I could talk maybe to Carmen, who's doing the recruitment, and Edward about who's going to hire, we could probably get those people into the organization and we could therefore get rid of expensive contractors and reduce our overall costs. So let's assume I'm going to do that. Having got ready access to both my finance and my HR recruitment information there, we're going to try and bring those people forward and hire them earlier. What I therefore would want to do is potentially is update my forecast. So I'm going to do that by flipping across to my um, budgeting and forecasting area, which again is just a quick click on a button. And hopefully that will wake up. There we go. So I'm now into my budgeting and planning area and I can look at my various menus down here and I can see that in my area, I've got a set of tasks which I need to do each month to update my forecast or, or um, review my forecast. So let's look at that. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit because I can see that's a bit small already. There we go. So there are a set of tasks that um, Katrina has been asked to do. First one up here, she's already done, but we'll do it again, is to look at a, a report that looks at basically the variance between your current forecast and the original budget. So I can see here's my under working budget here. This is my forecast and this is my original start of year budget. At the moment, they're in line. Nothing's changed. But now I know I'm going to hire those people earlier. I'm going to adjust my workforce plan. So I can see here all the people who are in my team and then I've got these vacancies at the bottom and we weren't expecting to hire people into those empty roles in Edward's team until April. I'm going to change that and bring them forward. So I think I can get those in by January and I can uh, put a comment in there for whatever reason that was. And you can see as I enter those comments, this is blue. So that means it's unsaved. If I save it here, when I save that, all of the impact of hiring those people earlier is being cascaded through the model automatically. So if I now go back to my variance analysis report, we can see we've now got variances in here. Because I've hired those people earlier, 
For example, here on, under my income statement, I can see under expenses and allocations, I've got additional payroll costs, as you'd expect, because I'm going to start paying those people. But I've also got taxes, I've got office expenses, because we're going to have to give them a phone maybe, or we're going to allocate part of our phone bill based on an additional headcount. And if I scroll down, I can see, for example, that there are additional assets down here. So my, my overall asset load and my depreciation is going to increase because I've got to give them a laptop and a desk and all the rest of it. So just by making that one little change to my um, my hire date for those people into Edward's team, I've immediately updated both my, my forecast, but all of, all of my outturn and my uh, variance calculations as well. So pardon me, I seem to have gone one click too far. So just to finish off, we'll look very quickly at the last role we're going to look at today, which is at more of a corporate role. So Teresa, who's my final person for the day, if I know full screen, is in a corporate role. And she's got access to the same information that we've seen all of the other users, but at a much higher level. So here, Teresa's got access to things like dashboards and scorecards. So if I look into my expense management scorecard, for example, that's Teresa. Let me let that wake up. Okay, and a few system problems here today. Bear with me, I'm sure I can fix them. There we go. So I can see here, if I change this to the right kind of chart, let's change it to a that kind of chart. There's quite a lot of costs in airfare here. There's a lot, my main area of cost is hotel bills, but I've got problems with a lot of people claiming airfares. So I might want to look at that. And again, I can drill that. What, what airline are we, are we flying with? But what might be more interesting is to look at that maybe by cost center or possibly by something like the management level. So if we've got people taking flights or international flights, I might want to check, are they senior people? Are they... Are they um, directors and so on, or are they uh, individual contributors? So I can see here the chief exec has been flying, but most of those costs are actually coming in from individual contributors down here. So again, this is where I might drill down to the detail and look at all the individual flights and who's been taking them and where they've been going, and maybe have a conversation with the cost center manager about why Amanda Baker has been spending information, uh, um, departmental money on airfares. And exactly the same applies to any other charts and graphs that I and dashboards I may want to access. So under procurement here, for example, because all of the information and the analytics are within the system, these, these charts are all being updated in real time. So I can drill into my total spend here and I can maybe say which cost center manager's department has been contributing the most to that spend. And it looks like Christine's area over here has the, has the biggest spender. I might then want to look at a different dimension, like how much of that spend is actually backed by a contract. So again, I don't have to go to a data warehouse to do that. This is all happening inside the system in real time. And I can see a significant proportion of Christine's spend to have no PO or no invoice or no order, sorry. So that's where I might drill in and say, well, what kind of spend was that? Well, it was gas and it was phone bills, which might be and utilities, which might be understandable, but her office supplies, four and a half thousand or four and a half million, half a million here. I might want to drill down into that in more detail and say, well, who, which supplier is she buying office supplies from? because they may not be the contracted one. And I can see there are three different suppliers, one of, several of which are not the contracted suppliers. So again, I've got ready access within my finance system, not in my data warehouse, in real time, to information around what, what's going on in my department or in my people. I think finally, the last two clicks, and then we'll, we'll move back to Stephen. And really, I just wanted to wrap this up. So let's look at an income statement report, because it's Always nice to look at a corporate um, statement. Again, if I look at this, I'm consolidating this across maybe multiple agencies across my department. That's all done in real time, but I can immediately start drilling into this information. So I've got my cost breakdown here. My total cost for the period is 10.52 million. But I can immediately again drill into whatever information I need to drill in to understand that data. So I might look at it initially by location. And I can see in my case, I've got locations across the country, across Europe. London's a big one. So let's look into London. And maybe now I will look at that by cost center. So again, I can go wherever I want to. This is not hard coded into the report. Here's Edward's team or Katarina's team with their 72,000 pounds of the spend. So that one's what I might want to drill and understand what that spend's all about. What, what, is, what have they been spending their money on? And then again, I can see that information down here. And I can see some of its payroll, some of its computers, some of its salaries. And there's expenses down here as well. And if we drill into the expenses down here by worker, I can get back to that same information we saw earlier. There's Emma, there's her 227. And then 
finally, if we drill back down, even though we started at a consolidated departmental income statement, I'm now down to individual expense transactions here. Everything's flowing up in real time at every level of the organization that I might choose to look at it. So I think that's probably all I've got time for and a bit more. So I'll go back to um, the PowerPoint. And, oh, I'm sorry. Next. This one. Yeah, yep. the clicks down. <clears throat> I'll give you the last. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. So um, I think then it's probably fair to say uh, that finance is at the heart uh, of, of all this decision making. And um, in order for finance to be um, uh, successful, uh, they need to have the right tools and uh, information to be able to kind of enable uh, those right decisions. So uh, what I wanted to do in uh, this short section is just to take a moment to talk about what we think the future uh, of finance looks like, uh, to understand that the role of finance and the impact that, uh, that finance will have on decision making within the organisation and the role that technology will play uh, in that part as well. So at Workday, we believe uh, that it will look like an, uh, an augmented finance function where decision making is simplified by taking essentially the transactional or manual work out of the process to allow finance to focus on uh, the value added activity uh, that will ultimately enable the departments or organisations that they s support. And in helping our own customers navigate the future of finance, we created this uh, framework for intelligence strategies. And these highlight the four stages, or these four stages outline how we believe intelligence will impact the enterprise, moving from making today's operations more efficient to reorganizing operations around the unique possibilities uh, intelligent technologies will offer in the near future. So we see automation of key processes as the first stage. This leads on to the use of data to provide prediction and insight to looking at new ways of doing things, such as managing by exception to leading to a complete organizational transformation at the final stage. Seems to be missing a slide. Um, ah, there we go, thank you. So there was a, a study that was conducted by McKinsey which looked at automation opportunities and it highlighted that transactional activities are the most automatable, but opportunities exist across most sub-functions. Uh, this chart shows the variable levels of automation opportunities across the financial roles, where the bluish bars on the right side represent the opportunity to highly or full and fully automate functions uh, within those roles. We feel this is significant because automation and ultimately these new technologies can and will fundamentally redefine uh, the role of finance and the impact that it will have on the organisation. So, having rather... Uh, spoiled my, <laughs> my crazy little picture but take this picture and just take a moment to think about what you see here so is it a muffin or is it a chihuahua well to technologists uh, it's just data so you know, now it's kind of a case of thinking about how long uh, will it take you to identify the chihuahuas from the muffins what if you didn't have all of the pictures in the same place to start with Modern technology essentially will automate that process and reduce the risk of error, and machine learning can become a game changer for the future of finance. But of course, I think what we've seen today and um, what's going to be critically important to all of this and to make it all happen, will ultimately come down to the data which is being held at the core. I'm sure you've heard all heard the expression, bad data in is bad data out, or words to, to that effect. So knowing and planning for where your data is held will be critically important in the future uh, for the future of the finance. Having data from the same platform will lead to the opportunity for simplification and decision making will be made that much easier because users would be using the same real time information upon which to base decisions. So essentially, without the right data, what we're saying is that this magic uh, won't be possible. So ultimately, evolving technology with greater automation and deeper insights from augmenting analytics will result in extra time for the finance function. This will mean finance will be better positioned to predict and guide the organisation 
and enable the finance team to provide a continuous strategy to the organisation around it. The future here then means that finance will be able to perhaps protect their department, you know, use rich insights to identify opportunities and provide the ability to course correct uh, before something becomes an issue. It could mean that uh, finance will be able to predict optimal spend plans and through insights drive department heads to make the right decisions and to cascade plans to all department areas so that there is, uh, so that they're all built and based upon uh, the right strategy and data, you, leveraging insights from across the organisation. So I'm going to hand back to Andy now to take us through a brief second demonstration of what the future of finance will look like. Okay, thank you Stephen. So, let's get rid of all of the other things we were doing. So what I'm going to look at now is um, future information. So when Stephen mentioned at the beginning, we were going to look a bit beyond the present into the future. Um, bear with me while I get where I want to go. What we're going to look at here is, is what we're working on in Workday as an example of the application of some of these technologies to um, how finance could be improved in the future using things like machine learning and augmented analytics and other things I'll talk about. So I'm going to start here. This is, this is not live, as you can probably gather. This is my uh, simulation. But it, we're going to start here as, as Teresa again uh, and look at how life might be for Teresa in, in the future, in a few years' time, rather than as it is now. So as most people, and certainly as I do, my day starts on my phone. My phone is my alarm clock. And when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I check my phone. And I look at my emails and I look at any alerts from my applications. And that's very much the way that most people these days tend to work. So in the future, uh, in, in the labs, Workday Assistant is extending to deliver targeted briefings to people like Teresa. So Teresa gets her Workday briefing pushed to her automatically. And you can see straight away from here, the assistant either through spoken voice, which I've got turned off for now, or, or through text, is alerting Teresa that there's a daily briefing and various things need her attention. So we've loaded in some operational activity from one of our operational systems and the accounting engine has been created that's ready for reviewing. There's an issue with um, the AR reconciliation process, maybe it's part of the month end that she needs to pay attention to. And there are some anomalies here that have been identified, in this case in, the, in bonuses. So this is not a, a government specific demo, this is a generic demo, but something's happened that requires her attention. And then also down here, I've got another message that says there are some business insights, would you like to hear them? So of course she would. And this is another part of work. This is, this is a storytelling part of Workday. So this is now, rather than just delivering graphs and reports and charts, this is actually delivering information in natural language. So it's telling Teresa here that there's been an increase in revenue and revenue is therefore above target, but also the cost of revenue have gone up. So maybe the, while we were trying to grow our revenue in this case, we've, we've incurred un, un, unexpected costs and therefore our margins are under pressure. So that immediately, uh, via that little notification on my phone alerts me to where I need to focus my attention when I do get to the office later on. So let's move forward a little bit and imagine now Teresa has arrived in the office and this is her controller dashboard. So this is really where she'll spend the first part of her day looking at information she needs to pay attention to. So if I just scroll in a little bit here, zoom in a bit so you can see. First chart we've got here is something called the accounting center. So this is basically large volumes of operational data in whatever business or organization we're in being loaded into the finance system at a very granular level of detail. And then the accounting impact of that being registered and the journals being created in the system. Um, and crucially that enables us to drill back within our finance system from the um, financial impact of those transactions to the actual transaction data themselves. So as a user in a single dashboard, I can drill through my financial statements, through my income statement or my budget report, but I can drill to the underlying data and from the operational systems at a granular detail level to understand what's causing any anomalies or trends I might see. Equally, if we scroll down, what, what we're looking at here is, is machine learning based anomaly detection. So at the end of the month, if, if you're anything like my experiences in finance, there's all sorts of anomalies and problems which get turned out by the accountants which need to be resolved and investigated so we can actually do the, the financial close. What we're doing here is applying anomaly detection in real time. So as transactions are coming into the system, you see down the bottom we've got day of the month. As transactions are hitting the system, anything that looks odd or anything that doesn't match the normal expected behavior is immediately thrown up by the system as a potential anomaly and routed to the relevant people for investigation. 
So as Teresa here, I can see there's been an issue with an interface from some feeder system. And normally we expect to see a region in each of those transactions. And some of those transactions in this case had that data missing. So there's a data feed issue coming in from an interface, which I'm sure we've all seen. The good news I can see here is that the accountant, James, has already fixed that. So whatever the problem was, he's got onto that. He was alerted as soon as that happened on day eight, and he's fixed it. So I don't need to worry about that one. Equally, there's a big old blob here, which is telling me there's a large financial implication of that one. This is those bonus accruals we saw on our alert on the phone earlier. So there are some unexpected accruals, which are higher than normal, that have been flagged up by the system as potential anomalies. And they've been, again, routed to James for him to investigate. He's already done that. He's spoken to Brenda, who was the, the manager or whatever in charge. She's confirmed that is correct. It, it is unusual, but it is right. So again, I don't have to worry about it. There are some red issues here that haven't been investigated yet. So those are probably the ones where I need to focus my time. But by resolving those anomalies as they occur, rather than waiting till the month end, I can deal with them, solve them, so that my, my close and my, therefore my financial reporting is much quicker and less delayed. Again, over here, we've got reconciliation tasks that are being found out or allocated to different people based on their responsibilities. Most of them are going well, but I can see Jenny here as having problems with resolving the AR um, balances here. And that again corresponds to the alert that Teresa saw on her phone earlier. And again, if I drill into that, and just zoom in a little bit, I can see a set of tasks. So the system again has spotted what tasks within the financial close are currently of highest priority. So this is not just a, a, a sequential list of tasks. This is those tasks which have the highest impact and are delaying other tasks or have potentially the most financial um, cost associated to them. They've been routed to various people so I can see who's responsible for those. And over here I can see that Jenny has been asked to resolve this issue where there's an imbalance on AR between the ledger and the GL. And we can see straight away the system has not only told her there's a problem here, but it's also suggested what might be causing that problem. So again, using machine learning, it's, it's identified some anomalous looking transactions and said, I think these are the most likely cause of this reconciliation error. So Jenny doesn't have to route through all that and, and find those transactions. The system suggested them for her. And again, we can use that collaborative capability over here to, to communicate in a secure, auditable way within the system what's going on. So as Teresa, I'm going to ask Jenny, does she have the invoices for those? And this is the sort of conversation we'd normally have via email off outside the system, in which case all of this conversation is typically lost. Here, because we're doing it within the system, Jenny has immediately provided me the invoices that I can, I can use to check whether the suggested anomalies are in fact correct, and they are, so I can thank her for that. And that's done. The key thing is that all of that conversation and that dialogue is within the system, is in context within those transactions. So if we do get an audit later on and somebody asks us to explain what that reconciliation issue was, I've got this whole conversation, including the associated documents, all sort of stored and auditable, all of which is saving me time. So if we go back to my dashboard and I just zoom back out a little bit. The other thing that, I, that Teresa is responsible for here is, is managing the operational health of the organization. So another part of her dashboard here is these um, insights that have been presented to her. And again, this is the storytelling we saw earlier. These are not static KPIs that have been pre-coded in the system. These are insights that the system has uncovered by looking through the data and identifying trends and, and trends that may be significant. So these might be different for each user and for each period. There's, nobody's gone in and coded these. These are generated by the system based on what it thinks is significant and what might be of interest to Teresa. So it's telling me here, not only has revenue gone up and costs have gone up as well, but down the bottom here, I can see it's telling me why they're going up as well. So I can drill into the, the cause analysis. It's suggesting that revenue is up because we've been selling more consulting in France. Costs are up because we've got bigger bonuses in the field sales organization and so on. And then again, I can drill into these if I need to, to see additional detail. So when we've been testing this, this type of stuff with um, customers and, and others and analysts, what we've, we've found is that, that sort of stuff really appeals to finance people because it's automating a lot of the stuff they currently do manual, manually and taking a lot of that routine work out. But there's also a feedback that we still need access to that data. It's great to have dashboards and insights, but we want to get access to the data, the sort of stuff we typically would do in Excel nowadays. So this part of the system here, this is something called worksheets within Workday, which is basically Excel inside the system. 
The key difference being this data is live, so I can refresh it at any point. It's secure, so I can only see data I should see, and it's collaborative, so I can, I can have conversations around this data with my peers. The other feedback, finally, is that's great, and that information, type of information is useful to accountants, but I could never give that to a senior manager or an executive. So this is where this part of the system kicks in. This is called Live Pages, which is effectively PowerPoint within Workday. So again, these graphs and charts are being fed by live data, but I'm presenting it in a PowerPoint-like environment. And that means I can add things like commentaries and annotations, and I can publish these within the organization um, to those executives and senior managers who need access to them, rather than taking data out of Workday into unsecure things like Microsoft Office. So I think I've said enough. So to summarize, I think the, really what I was trying to do there is illustrate some of the points, there we go, that Stephen was making earlier, that in the future, um, information will be provided much more in a conversational manner. We won't be looking at traditional reports, we'll be much more about having dialogues and conversations with the information. It'll be automated, so machine learning and other technologies will automatically perform routine tasks for us and only identify or involve people where human intervention is required. And finally, it will be providing insights using things like these augmenting analytics to find pertinent and relevant information with causes and effects and present them in new and useful ways um, to the users of the system. And finally, Ed. Thank you, Andy. That was, that was excellent. And I hope you all appreciate what uh, the world of finance is going to look like and, and can all appreciate the benefits. So I really just want to finish on um, just one, one key sort of message here, really, which is one of the things that we're finding is let, let's be joined up. So, so let's be joined up kind of is related to two things. Um, the first thing really is that let's be joined up across the functions. So let, let's, let's see finance um, joining together and taking very much control of joining and bringing together the, obviously the controllership with the FP&A um, guys and bringing together and with them the executives and the line of business, which means that we need to be joined up with the data. So not only are we going to be bringing together the people, but we need to bring with it the data as well, because at the end of the day, that wonderful new world of finance will operate much more effectively if we can bring together the operational data in terms of, you know, what is a department there to do? Are they there to make decisions, create policy, write legislation, um, or, or or, or man a wing in a prison. You know, that bit of operational data in terms of key, you know, key jobs that people are doing that are measurable, um, if that's enriched with financial information that is both plan and actual, then you end up in a world where you can actually start thinking about one single holistic new world where you can plan, execute and analyze across the entire business within very much one single framework, one single solution, but more importantly, uh, one operational leader or one executive can then sit in control of, if you like, the day-to-day -day, uh, keeping score, but much more importantly, uh, finance can have much more impact on, on driving those much better, much more informed decisions. In other words, finance is put right back at the center, at the center of decision-making uh, within government going forwards. That's great. Thanks very much, Ed and Andy as well. Uh, I hope everyone uh, on the call has found this uh, presentation useful and we'd be very happy to speak to you uh, more about the, our research into uh, the finance function. Uh, that largely concludes our presentation. So Kevin, I'm going to hand back to you now for any questions. If there are questions uh, that listeners feel they can't perhaps ask here in this forum, or that we don't have a chance to answer to today, we'll be very happy to get in touch with you after this webinar. So thank you very much. And Kevin, back to you. Thank you. That's a very interesting insight um, into both what can be done now and in the future. Um, I think uh, we're all um, aware in the working around the civil service, how much finance has become um, a, a, a um, promoted uh, um, function in government uh, as part of um, much more um, significant in decision-making um, roles. So I guess um, there's a few questions um, we've we've got 
outlining this and and one is um, do you see the finance and HR functions becoming part of a single corporate service directorate in in future yeah, thank you for that I much appreciate the question it is at the heart of if you like what workday strives to do and what we found is that very much if you can see the people behind the finances or the finances behind the people and you can start seeing together as one then you're ending up in a much more enriched collaborative environment so we very much believe that um the, the, the if you like the boundaries of the past that used to sit between hr and finance um are, are, are much better being if you like removed where possible and that data is is shared and it's a much more enriched environment if you can do that because if you can imagine you start with a fiscal plan and you work it down into your sort of your capex your opex and then your workforce plan it all ultimately rolls up and in, back into that fiscal plan and and they all work very much in concert together as one okay Thank you. And just to remind um, people, if you would like to ask a question, there is a Q&A function at the, um, on your uh, webinar facility. Please feel free to type uh, your questions to us uh, there. One's come in on um, uh, actually a quite practical question on how much of this functionality is currently live in the UK and in the public sector. So how much, um, it, how much of the public sector is actually using this kind of service at the moment? Yeah, it's Andy here. So, so I think the, the two parts of the demo I, I showed there, the, the, the first part was, was Workday as it is today. So every customer of Workday uh, is using that functionality. Um, and that, that's just the core part of the Workday technology. They're, they're not optional extras or bolt-ons, that's just Workday. The second bit, which I showed, which was the, the more future stuff, that is futures. So at the moment, that, that's why we had the, uh, the, the warning at the beginning. That, that stuff um, in the second demo is stuff that we are trialing. We have got customers who are using that in our beta program, not in the UK public sector, as far as I know, um, but that is what's going to be coming down in the, in the next 12 to 18 months into the Workday product. And, and just as a complimentary answer to that, the Workday Assistant is being, uh, being used in a trial basis at the Cabinet Office today as well. Fantastic. Um, how best can finance share data with other functions such as data warehouse and or, or analytics teams? I'll, I'll start that one again. And it's, it's Andy again. Um, I think that, that's an interesting topic um, and we talked a lot today and we didn't show that much of it but we talked about this concept of bringing operational data into your finance HR system. Um, what, what we're not trying to do is replace corporate data warehouses. There's always a requirement for those or there will be in the future but what we have recognized with our customers is that the, the data that um, is the hardest uh, to model and extract to a data warehouse is typically your finance and HR structures. When we look at data warehouse projects, getting HR data and finance data out of your corporate systems into a data warehouse is typically a large part of the complexity because that, that sort of data changes frequently. There are multiple hierarchies, there are snapshots and so on that need to be helped. Um, so what we're finding, and, and certainly work-based um, principle on this, is to, where possible, bring operational data into your finance and HR system. And we have technologies that allow huge amounts of data to, to be brought in easily and joined with your finance and HR data. So you're not taking your, particularly your HR data in, in the days of GDPR out of your corporate system of record and putting it into a data warehouse where you've got to worry about securing it and right to, to be forgotten and so on. You bring your operational data into your Workday system and that's what allows you to A, join it up to your Workday data so you can drill through from high level HR or financial metrics to the operational drivers but also be able to use those existing security um, policy access um, constructs to make sure only the right people can access that data. So often it's more about how can finance become uh, or expand its reach in terms of the type of data it works with to include operational data, often potentially fed from a data warehouse inside Workday alongside the, the, the finance and HR information. Thank you. Um, and we're coming close to time. So I think this is a suitable final uh, s s uh, question, which is what are the first steps finance can take today to increase its relevance and have greater impact on decision making? When we think about planning and we think about how finance supports the planning activity, 
rather than just looking at the fiscal plan alone, is to get to the underlying drivers. So understand with the operational teams what is actually driving behaviour, then focus on bringing that data into, into the finance domain so that you can then very much support not only driver-based planning, but you can then have driver-based monitoring and reporting going forward. So that's a much more predictable uh, and resilient environment and also a much more relevant environment for operational leaders and executives to work within. So, as I said, get to the drivers and, and whatever those may be. It may be that you can, you can model um, so many people within a wing at a prison or so many people to support decision making uh, within departments or, uh, or, or, or a number of people that are required for a, uh, a policy team or for uh, legislation. Each area will have its own drivers. Focus on those, follow the money that comes out of that, and then finance will end up in a much better position to be relevant uh, and supporting the business going forwards. Thank you. Um, and uh, that um, concludes our, our questions. And that's all we have time for. And um, I just, uh, in, in conclusion, like to ask Stephen or the speakers to um, are, um, make any final comments, uh, perhaps one takeaway you'd like the audience to, to really go back with from this. Sure, it's Stephen here. So uh, I'll, I'll start then at least. Um, I, finance transformation has been talked about for a long time and I think that's partly because there hasn't been a solution which is able to kind of keep pace with the changing technology uh, and they truly offer uh, organisations the ability to, to transform. And I think in order for finance to play an active role uh, in an organisational department access, it, it needs to change tact. There's so much data and information out there that finance are being asked to do more with less and it's quite often on these same old uh, systems and spreadsheets. So um, to be ready for the future, finance functions need to look at ways to simplify processes and pre procedures. They need to uh, embrace technology and automate uh, where possible uh, and keep pace with the rate of change uh, in the world today. So uh, I think that, you know, that's what I believe and I think that's what Workday believe uh, the future of uh, finance will look like. Guys, is there anything that you might want to add? No, I think I think the last thing I'd perhaps say is this, this maybe seems like a, a sort of Star Trek futuristic vision. I think the work they view is very much not to look for, not to find cool technologies and then try and figure out what to do with them. It's to come the other way, to look at what are the problems that are facing finance people and others, and then look at how can new technology be applied to it. So we, we, our plan is not to provide chatbot functionality or frameworks, it's to provide real solutions and those real insights um, to business problems and that's perhaps a more practical way from a business perspective to look at this rather than seeing it as a bit of a geek fest and uh, what cool things can I do with technology which is often the case. And I think just to sort of wrap that up in a, uh, in, in, in a simple expression that I think we're all becoming uh, familiar with is the idea that it has to be self-service but it has to be easy to use. People will adopt easy to use technology that's personalised, that's chatty where appropriate and that's relevant and if you focus on the easy to use and the relevant um, then, then the rest will sort itself out.